1975, these two worlds collide. And did you feel an instant connection, or do these things take time? You know, people want to hear that um, <laughs> the sun shone and the bell started ringing and hallelujah, it was all great. <laughs> But, you know, we went into the Nottingham Ice Rink at about 5.30 in the morning. We did, like, a two-hour session of skating, basic stuff like that. We probably we didn't say a word to each other, don't we? We were so <laughs> shy, you know, just barely able to touch hands. Um, but we skated, we got through it, and the coach at the end of the session said, well, what do you think? Are you, are you going to try it out? And we said, let's give it a week. And then after a week, she said, are you going to try it? Are you going to stay together? Let's give it another couple of weeks and a so you month sure. and a year. We still haven't decided. <laughs> <laughs> it became a bit of a superstition that if we said, yeah, we're going to skate together, that it would all go wrong. So mm. we never did. No. We? And, you know, we had full-time jobs. I mean, well, you I, were was a policeman. A, I was a policeman. You were an insurance clerk mm -hmm. at Norwich Union, so yes. you were pretty busy. I mean, how did you find the, the time to give the commitment <clears> to skating <throat> you have to do to be Well, there the were all hours that God sent because I was on shift work. So Jane had to kind of work around my schedule. So if I was in on afters, I'd work until 10 o'clock, take off the uniform, go down the rink. And um, we'd skate, we'd skate night, for didn't we? two or three hours and then start work the next day. So, and that was a life for oh, mm. five years like yeah. that. This is the kind of dedication it takes, isn't it? We were so passionate about it. You know, we'd invested a lot of time in skating and I think we just loved it and eventually, we decided that we've got to take the leap now and leave our jobs uh, uh, as an opportunity to progress up the ladder because we did start placing a little bit further up into the, in the international field. And actually, you went, I think, Jane, to the Dole office to sign on. A lot of skaters at the, at the Nottingham ring, they used to say, oh, go and sign on. And, and we so were we so went naive. Down, we went down then. they said, so what kind of job are you looking for? And we said, oh, we're not looking for a job because <laughs> we didn't quite get it. <laughs> Didn't know you to be actively seeking employment. No, we just want to skate. <laughs> so we didn't qualify. No. So they explain that's not how this works. Yeah. <laughs> no, the next they move, you, you wrote to the council in Nottingham. Yeah. Yes, um, somebody said, why don't you write a letter to the council, the city council? Because I've heard they might they, they sometimes sponsor people. You've got £42,000. Not, not an insignificant sum of money, but not a fortune. Um, when you heard you got it, did you think, OK, we bought ourselves some time. It was just amazing. You said it felt like being a millionaire, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, time. in those it days, was, um, it was like... It was £7,000 each a year. Um, and could you imagine in that moment that one day you'd have a housing estate in Nottinghamshire <laughs> named after you? It has 300 houses. Road names include Bolero Close, Jane Close, Christopher Close, Torville Heights, Dean Close. <laughs> oh, you become more famous than Robin Hood in Nottingham. <laughs> You were starting to make your name as world-class skaters, but the best was yet to come. By the early 80s, Chris and Jane's dedication had paid off when they started racking up British, European and World Championship titles. And their skating technique was becoming ever more sophisticated and daring. They wanted to be innovative with the lifts. They wanted to push the boundaries of where the grey areas were in the rules. They bent little rules and demands and... and... Johnny well done for them because they made it a different sport. You always tried to do what they had done the year before. You were never ahead of them. All you could really do was, was try and keep up. Got annoying after a while. But Jane and Chris already had their eyes set on the highest accolade of all, a gold of the 1984 Winter Olympics. And to win, they'd have to push those boundaries to the limit, starting with the music. What could they come up with for the Olympics? Ravel's Bolero. We thought, no way, this is not gonna, this isn't gonna work. It was the first time that a piece of music like that had been used in its entirety, or at least in a way that was not badly edited and there wasn't this juxtaposition, this cheesy music in the middle. It was, it was a unique piece. British medal hopes, of course, rest with ice dancers Torval and Dean. We bought into this so massively, don't let us down. The pressure would have been huge. The day of Bolero arrived, 14th of February 1984, the streets were deserted as 24 million people tuned in to watch their ice heroes. If you were even remotely into skating, or patriotic, or one of those people that happily jumped on a bandwagon, then you remember where you were that night when it all happened. There is nothing like being in an arena when those magic moments happen. 
you can't explain to people at home. It's it just has that. You can feel it now. You just remember the you know the, the hairs on the back of the neck go up. Kneeling on the ice. You were just lost with the magic. Everybody was in floods of tears. It was beautiful to watch. When it finished, the place erupted. It's just one of those moments where you sit and watch and then it's... Wow! They produce the performance of a lifetime. Seeing success like that from PC Plod and the insurance clerk, golly. Nine sixes. Everyone at six. They are the marks that have never been beaten since. Everything came together. It was a perfect moment, as the scores um, told us. I was so proud to be British and so proud to know them. The Olympic champions returned to Britain triumphant. Had they been on skates, the champions might have been able to sweep past the press photographers, who accorded them a welcome normally reserved for Hollywood stars or pop singers. It's quite exciting. Oh, they just were megastars of sport. No one thought that ice skaters would become that well known and that loved by the British public. Chris, what do you think of it all here? It's too much, really. I really didn't expect that. The amount of people that had turned out to support them it was amazing. Thank you, really. Thank you very, very much. They became almost royalty to Great Britain. Everyone was completely in awe of them. There must have been moments where they thought, oh, my God, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know whether we signed up for this. Is this what we really want? But by then, too late, everybody wants a bit of you. Watching it again now reminded me of where I was watching it. I remember everybody watching it. What a moment for British sports. Did you feel it was as near to perfect a performance as you could have done? <laughs> <laughs> now, let me tell you about that. That final position, did you see me roll onto my tummy? Yes. That wasn't perfect. <laughs> that was the moment that I shouldn't have rolled onto my tummy. But they thought it was part of the routine, presumably. Uh, yeah, presumably. He, yeah. he was probably so relieved he was getting to the end, he <laughs> went for a dive. It was so much at the end, it, was, it really was impassioned at the end. I mean, Jane, I realised the technical fault immediately. I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you realise in that tiny split second that he'd, he'd done something wrong? Did you fear that may have jeopardised things? No, I, did, I couldn't feel it because I was in front of him. I think probably from the side it wouldn't have looked as bad. Mm. No, no, no. no. But also there was this whole... See what a perfectionist, he gets nine sixes and all he's doing is, it wasn't quite right. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your parents were there uh, and your dad reacted in a really surprising way. They were at um, Sarajevo and I went to meet them to s say goodbye and my dad just was just crying and my mum said, oh, Take no notice of it. <laughs> <laughs> Take no notice of it. But were you shocked? I mean, he, he yeah, I was he, actually. He wasn't normally that emotional kind of guy. From any time after that, he never liked to say goodbye. Mm. He got a bit emotional. It was almost like he was remembering that moment too. But her parents are very much what I, and my dad was. It, it was just kind of, he did well, yeah. <laughs> and my dad always used to say, um, not bad, not bad. <laughs> That's all I ever got from him. Even off the Olympics. And my mum always used to say, Oh, you did really well, she said, but there's always someone better than you. <laughs> on this occasion. 24 million people in Britain watched you win the gold medal. They're a third of the population. Quite extraordinary viewing figures. When was the moment you realised your lives probably weren't ever going to be the same, that you've now <laughs> become these huge stars? Stepping off the aeroplane, coming back to the UK, after the last championship and all the people there, it was like, whoa. And going around the city centre when we were paraded around in the Pope Mobile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was an amazing time. Um, and you couldn't go to Marks and Spencer's to get your underwear after that. No. <laughs> now, there was also, which I don't think British viewers will have been aware of, but 
you produced an album. <laughs> Torben and Dean, Here We Stand. This was mainly in Australia. It uh, was never released here. You look no, very no, wide. <laughs> Rather than just play one of the tracks on the album where it's all been polished and the producers have been at it, you produced a demo. Oh, uh, we didn't. This is a world exclusive of the demo song. It was a fine romance, most famously sung by <laughs> Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong, of course. <laughs> this is the new Ella and Louis. Take a listen to this. I don't think Ella and Louie need worry too much. Oh, gosh. But if you want to buy the album, <laughs> buy it. She's never talked about it in public before.